an enthusiasm, a craft, an art. That's the route that an artist takes on the path to perfection. Those things that bring us aesthetic satisfaction we call works of art, and we delight in a person's talent and call him a master. One hundred and fifty years ago, from Germany to Russia, came a flat tin miniature. Here it found its masters and appreciators. Works of these kinds were incredibly popular amongst all classes. During the era of the Soviet Union, the flat Nuremberg miniatures were preserved thanks to the tin soldiers that school children would cast with their own hands to later play with. That is what Vladimir Nuzhdin once did, an artist, an engraver, and a Russian master of flat miniatures. I've known Vladimir for over 12 years. He's one of the people who's responsible for my hobby, tin miniatures, specifically of the Nuremberg type. He got me involved in all of this. As far as his personal mastery is concerned, we can definitely say that this is the finest engraver in Europe. The Europeans themselves have acknowledged this, and if he's the finest engraver in Europe, then he's probably one of the finest engravers in the world, that's for sure. And he's a person with endless amounts of energy who can not only draw a figure, he can engrave it, he can cast it, and then finally he can place it in a diorama or a model, having made the model himself. This ability to create a diorama from its conception all the way through to its superb execution among collectors and producers of tin miniatures is required as an example of exceptional mastery. Its sources, as a rule, lie in childhood. But can we always see in the mass of interests and hobbies among children the craft that will later grow into an art? In childhood, after all, all is equally important and serious. In 1975, at the Suvorov Museum, I saw flat tin soldiers for the first time. Before that, I hadn't seen anything of the kind before. It was a real shock for me, of course. It created a furore. Everything bubbled up inside me, and I thought about it. I went home, and I immediately drew the same kind of figure as I'd seen. I cut it out of cardboard and coloured it in. I used oil paints. These were my first impressions from having seen a flat soldier. But then I was taken to the collector Mezenev. I came over poorly there, because I'd never seen anything like this. Mum was delighted, because for the coming year that was all I worked on. But a flat soldier, for me it was instantaneously an embodiment of a living person, because I saw volume in it, all the interplay that's needed in a normal picture. That was already there. It was a children's toy, tin soldiers, that decided the fate of Vladimir Nuzhdin. Flat Nuremberg miniatures have a long and rich history. Having appeared in the mid-19th century in Germany, the tin soldiers soon won great popularity among children across Europe. This was largely thanks to the Heinrichsen firm of Nuremberg, which set up the mass production of toy soldiers. It employed the finest artists and engravers of the day, who created real flat miniature masterpieces. As collector's items, the works of the Nuremberg masters attracted numerous renowned and powerful people. Almost every royal palace in Europe had its own miniature army, comprising thousands of soldiers. During the Second World War, the Heinrichsen enterprise suffered severely. The old moulds for casting were lost or severely damaged. At the end of the 1990s, the firm's representatives turned to Vladimir Nuzhdin for his aid in recreating the priceless moulds. You have to remember that in Germany he's known first and foremost as the restorer of the most precious things that remain from the 18th century. The name of the Russian restorer and the German molds themselves have melded into one. 
Ever since, Vladimir has gained many friends and admirers in Germany and around the entire world with whom he mixes with ease and with great satisfaction. Today, the collecting specifically of flat Nuremberg miniatures has attracted people of incredibly varied levels of income from all over the world. Some prefer figures of specific historic eras or states, while some collect the works of a single artist. For them, each and every work by Vladimir Nuzhdin is a priceless treasure. The entire school was painting or playing hockey, so in the ninth class, I didn't have a chance. So to keep me busy with something other than hockey or messing around, she put me under my uncle's wing, as it were, in ship model building club. I remember that I made sailing ships. And I even took first place in Leningrad in 1977 in teaching institutions with a sailing ship. I made it under the watchful eye of my uncle. My uncle was very strict and severe. He trained me up, as it were. Then he sent me to the Technical Institute at the Baltiski factory, where they trained me up as a patterner. That's to say that I learned how to engrave. When I went to the Baltiski factory, my uncle, so that I'd keep my hand in, as it were, assigned me to a sailor who'd received the Red Banner Award twice. His arms were like 16-kilo dumbbells. If you relaxed, he'd give you a clip around the ear. That was enough to send you flying under the table in tears. My uncle was strong. And when I came along, he said, well, they played a trick on us, the experienced engravers. And an engraver is the highest category, I don't know. We're not talking about a humble metal worker here. A metal worker's down there, but an engraver is the highest rank in the working of metal, as it were. As the machines weren't full milling machines, people would perfect them themselves, and they played a trick on us. There was an engraving sheet in which they'd set up tools. A gyroscope, for example, and so on. On there, they put balls from bearings, and it was as if they were floating in the air there, and underneath went the sheet. We were idiots, so we didn't realize that they were different magnetic poles. We were dumbfounded. How could this be? When you engrave a sheet like that, then you'll be an engraver. And so we really tried. There are a lot of jokes like that. You weren't supposed to even breathe on the surface of the sheet because the drops of dew would settle on it. That would be ideal engraving. So a mirror wasn't even that even as an engraving sheet. So there was all that. All that hard work taught me. Those life experiences really taught me because engraving is back-breaking labor. Vladimir Nuzhdin's art developed on the basis of a childhood hobby, becoming an occupation that he devoted all his free time to, away from his main work, an occupation that was far from painting. Nevertheless, the fruits of his labor were highly esteemed by professional artists and engravers. This kind of success is only possible when a person is entirely devoted to what they're doing. Vladimir Nuzhdin's friends, who are inevitably drawn into the artist's aura of bubbling energy and charm, quickly sense this. I first met Vladimir, well, like all meetings for doctors and surgeons, through the profession, over the operating table, as it were. That was over 20 years ago. He had a little problem that I had to sort out. Back then, when we met, as far as I can remember, he was still in the police, working as a detective. Then he left the police and dedicated himself to the arts. To start with, at the beginning, arts was just a hobby. Whatever he does, he puts 100% into it. When he was a policeman, he was the best, the finest detective in the whole of Leningrad during the Soviet era. He was released by the interior minister, Pulov, himself, because back when he was a policeman, he saw what Vladimir was doing. He was a collector and he signed his release without a moment's hesitation. I've got a lot of creative friends who work in various creative professions, but technique like this, this sphere of work, engraving, I'd never encountered this before. With Vladimir, it was the first time I'd encountered this. I saw how he worked, how he was doing this. It was absolutely incredible. It's done without any devices or special techniques. It's all done by hand. It's absolutely incredible. Talent, individual abilities given by nature, 
It's like a stone monolith. Will it remain a formless rock or will it turn into a wonderful statue? This will depend on how much time and effort the sculptor puts into backbreaking daily work, acquiring knowledge and experience in search of perfection. Perhaps studying the craft would shorten this path, but is that the case? And then I wanted to enroll at the Mohinska Arts Academy. I went to Professor Belibin. He was in charge of graphics and design, and so on at the time. I went to his home and I said, Ivan Dmitrievich, I'd like to enroll. He asked, what are we going to teach you? Instead, why don't you raise the level of our engraving school at least a little? You should be teaching. I said, no, that's not for me. So I never got a further education in the arts. But to put it bluntly, it hasn't hampered me in life at all. The first question after the Soviet Union collapsed was, what did you graduate from? I would say, nowhere really, apart from art school. Then they'd ask, but how can you do this? Well, that just seems to be the way the Lord has organized the stars, so that I can do this.